الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه جمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان لا يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ولاك توكم يرتونا سشن فرام the commentary on the 40 hadith of Imam al Nawi رحم الله and الحمد لله we are on hadith number 28 and a very important hadith and let us go forward to the recital عن أبي نجيح الإرباط بن سارية ودي عن قال وعذنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم موئضة وجلت منها القلوب وذرفت منها العيون فقلنا يا رسول الله كأنها موئضة مودع فأوسنا قال أوسيكم بالتقوى الله والسمع والطاعة وإن تمر عليكم عبد فإنه من يعيش منكم فسيرى اختلافا كثيرا فعليكم بسنتي وسنة الخلفاء الراشدين المهدئين عضوا عليها بالنواجذ وإياكم ومحتتات الأمور فإن كل بضعة ضلالة رواه أبو داود وترمدي وقال حديث حسن صحيح Translation it is narrated on the authority of Abu Naji, Al Irbad bin Sariya Wadu'an, who said, The Messenger of Allah وسلم, delivered an admonition that made our hearts fearful and our hearts tearful. We said, O Messenger of Allah, it is as if this were a farewell sermon. So advise us. Fa'ausina. He said, Usikum bi taqwullah. I enjoin you to have taqwa of Allah wa sama wa ta, and that you listen and obey even if a slave is made a ruler over you. He amongst you who lives long enough will see many differences. So for you, alaykum bi sunnati. So for you is to observe my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided successors. Hold on to them with your molar teeth. Addu bin nawajid. وَيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْتَتَاتِ الْأُمُورِ And beware of newly invented matters for every bid'ah is an error. فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِيَطٍ ضَلَالَ And this is narrated in Abu Dawood and also Tirmidhi who said it is an authentic hadith. So as is our tradition, let us go to the narrator of this hadith which is Abu Najih al-Irbad bin Sariya رضي عنه Most of us do not know him but he is actually one of the earliest companions to accept Islam. He himself said, I was the fourth person to accept Islam. However, this is relative. I mean, this is not specifically accurate, but basically this means that he was one of the earliest of the Sahaba to accept Islam. And this just goes to show the rank of this Sahabi who narrates this hadith. Because again, As-Sabiqoon, as The ones who are in front, the ones who are the foremost... They are the ones who also are in highest in rank. So let us, inshallah, be those who rush to do the good deeds because they earn the best of the blessings. And he also, of the people of Ahlu Sufa, and these were dedicated companions as we discussed before, those who dedicate their life to be with the Prophet wasallam, And there will be an area right next to the masjid, right outside Madinah Manawar, the masjid, and this is where they would reside and live. And the Prophet and the companions would take care of Ahl Sufa because these really were people who were, in a sense, doing itikaf 24-7 and just to be with the Prophet and wherever he was. This Sahabi, many students narrate from him, including his daughter. And he ended up migrating to Hims in Syria, in Sham, after the passing of the Prophet And there was a story which Imam Dahabi, the famous historian, the great scholar, he narrates in his book. And he narrates that this Sahabi, Abu Najih, he was fond of making specific dua. He said, Oh Allah, my body has become old and my body has become weak, so call me to you. And the story goes that he actually ran into an immensely handsome young man in the masjid, on the mosque of Dimashk, Damascus. And this person, this young person had a green overcoat. And he said to him, 
what are you doing? What type of dua are you making? Then this Sahabi, he turned to this young man and he said, well, what type of dua should I make? Because why are you longing or making a dua for death? So then this young person, he said, well, why don't you say this? Allahumma hasan al-amal wa ballik al-ajal. Oh Allah, give me the tawfiq to do good deeds and allow me to reach death in the state that I am in. Beautiful dua because of course we want to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing the best of deeds. And if we've been doing a lot of good deeds, we want to continue until it is our time in which has been destined. And the Sahabi, he said to him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Radba'il and my job is to remove and take grief and sorrow from the believers and Allah has sent me to bring peace to people. And of course this young man, this Rudba'il, he was actually an angel from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he taught him, the Sahabi, this beautiful dua. And Abu Najih would pass later sometime after this incident. Rudu'an. Now let's go into this beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallam. As Abu Najih narrates, وَعَذَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ مَوْئِذَةً وَجِرَتْ مِنْهَا الْقُلُوبِ وَدَرَفَتْ مِنْهَا الْعُيُونِ So here the, Abu Naji says that Prophet Sallallahu was admonishing us, giving us a beautiful sermon. And it was as if it was his final sermon. Okay. The tears were wet, our hearts were entranced into this beautiful sermon of the Prophet Sallallahu So Ibn Rajab describes the Prophet Sallallahu Sermons or khutbah and speeches and admonitions as brief, concise, and done in a beautiful and eloquent manner, and often touching the hearts, okay, affecting a full effect. And in one of the narrations of this hadith, that it was mentioned that the Prophet actually gave this sermon after the Fajr Salah. And one of the reasons that the Sahaba cried is because the Prophet had indicated indirectly that he would be leaving the world soon and thus the Sahaba wanted and requested a farewell advice you know in case this was the last conversation they had with Prophet Sallallahu before his passing so then they said فَأَوْسِنَا okay then advise us give us admonition okay so the number one first point of the hadith is to have taqwa I advise you to have taqwa of Allah, to have taqwa. And we talked about taqwa, right where the Prophet says, Ittaqullah Have taqwa wherever you may be. Okay. Well, that's the number one point of this hadith. The second point is, okay. And to listen and obey the appointed leaders of the community. Because the Prophet now here he's giving advice for the future. He is giving advice for the future because it's obvious that the Prophet is going to pass away soon. So they need to be prepared for what happens after the Prophet And this is a very important hadith, very important admonitions for the Sahaba and for us because now the Prophet is not with us. So he says, and listen or obey to the leaders. وَإِن عَلَيْكُمْ أَبْدُ And this is perhaps very hard to swallow. And even if a slave is made to rule over you, so, and I mean, in which society, which community would a slave be ruling over the people? You have the ranks of society being reversed. You know, often it's very hard to swallow. But the Prophet system is just saying just that. How important it is to obey the leader. Okay. And this denotes a couple of things. The Prophet system now is giving a command to the Muslim Ummah that now your leaders actually have rights over you. So the leader gets these rights as soon as he is put into the position of leadership. So from this hadith, these are the two rights of the leader. Okay, and they are from the bay'ah, or the pledge. And the leader gets these rights as soon as he becomes the leader, if the people of knowledge and, and position accept that he is the leader. And so to hear and obey is a right of the Muslim leader due to the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ 
فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ تَأْوِيلًا صلى الله عليه وسلم سيدنا سورة النساء يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيع الله وأطيع الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم okay. Obey Allah and obey the messenger and those who are in authority among you and if you disagree over everything then فردوا إلى الله ورسوله Refer to Allah and His Messenger if you should believe in Allah in the last day. That is the best way and that is the best in result. So here is a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in concurrence with this very powerful hadith. Okay, to listen and obey. So Allah and His Messenger now have ordained on us to obey the leader. But to temper this obedience is another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he says, لا طاعة في معصية الله. A very important hadith where the Prophet says there is no obedience to any creation in disobedience to Allah. And this is narrated by Abu Abdul Rahman in Surah Al Nasai and Greater As Sahih. So we obey the Muslim leaders in that which is not a sin and do not obey them in sin. So anything which is mubah. Well, anything which is farad we have to obey, and even things which are mubah or allowed, if they command us to do it, we obey them because this is a haq of the leader. Remember, they are a different level. Leaders and the people who are put in church are a different level. You may not exactly know what the situation is in the context, because they're put in a different type of role. And sometimes, something which is mubah may be farad on the community for its protection, for its well-being. There's a haq on the community for the Muslim leader for many different reasons. Number one, for unity, to prevent disunity, to prevent chaos and disarray and civil war. So the commands of the Muslim leaders are of three types. Number one, if he orders that which Allah and His Messenger ordered, then we must obey Him. Not because of His order, but because of it being commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's understood. But the second part is something which is again something which we have to swallow out of obedience to Allah and His Messenger. I mean, it's easy to follow Allah, it's easy to follow the Rasul for any true believer. But when you're asked to follow another person, you know, who is below that rank of Allah's Messenger, it's a little bit more difficult to do. And like, for example, our parents, they have such a haq over us. So if they command us to do something, which is allowed, if they command, really command, that we're obligated to follow because of the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. But similarly, the leader is put on this pedestal also for the greater good for the community. And if he orders that, if he orders that which Allah and His Messenger allowed but did not obligate, then it becomes binding upon us that we obey Him in that. And it's also the same thing if there's a difference of opinion with of the scars on some matter which is mubah as well. Okay, I mean just for greater unity. So for example, if there's a Khalifa and he says that, well, okay, this day is going to be Eid and this is according to the Sharia. This is not something which is outside the Sharia. More of those opinions, whether it's global, whether it's local, whether even it may be calculations because there's Hadith which support that as well, even though that's the less Abdul opinion. So if the leader of the whole Muslim Ummah were to say, well, we'll have to do Eid on based on calculations, then like it's a command, right? it's not a recommendation, then we have to follow him because of the statement of Allah and His Messenger. Yeah. And there's greater hikmah for that, because there's unity involved, there's prevention of chaos and other stuff as well. That's number two. Number three, however, if he orders, if the ruler orders us to do something, that Allah and His Messenger clearly prohibited, then, لَا بَعْتَ فِي مَعْصِيَةِ اللَّهِ Without any doubt. Okay, so Allah's command takes over. The Prophet's command takes over, and then we should not obey the leader in that sense. Okay, and this is with regards to everyone, whether it's our parents. If they ask us something, for example, if they ask you to take off your hijab, or ask you not to do something, like to leave a salah or something like that, 
not to pay the zakah, then obviously we have to disobey him because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, there's no doubt that they are the ones who have to be obeyed. And we're only even obeying the parents because of the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And the same is true also if the family is forcing opinion on you, your loved one, your spouse, la ta'ata fi ma'asiyatillah, and this la is la an nafi wal jins, the categorical negation as well. Going forward in this hadith, where the Prophet says, wa in tamaru alaykum abd. Okay. So here, what does this show us? What does this point out? Because many people may just read this translation superficially, may not actually get the point. What is Rasulullah telling us? Wa in tamaru alaykum abd. How does a slave become a leader? You know, what situation does a slave become a leader? Is it just something where the slave is elected? Because you have to also go back to the Islamic perspective of slavery in Islam. is something which obviously Islam came to eradicate slavery, but it did not completely negate it. Okay, this was obviously in stages. So the ones who became slaves were actually POWs, right? And then they had their rights, obviously. They were treated as humans. They were fed. They were clothed. They were treated appropriately and nicely as Islam commanded. They were not like, ruthlessly tortured or treated like a subhuman, as in the transatlantic slave trade. Okay? But anyway, in that society, the slave would obviously be at the lowest level in terms of a rank. Okay? So how would a slave elevate himself to become a leader? Well, it would basically this imply that there is war and bloodshed. Right? There is basically a forced struggle. That would put him, or the slave perhaps, into the position of leadership. Because that's really the only way the slave could be a leader. But this implies that the slave, the leader, is basically forcing himself upon that nation, or the people. So even if a slave were to become your leader, Rasulullah says, you have to obey him. And that is actually very difficult for us to swallow. Think about it. The least desirable person, the one the lowest in rank, the one who has perhaps forced his way upon that nation, or that the people and become a leader now is to obey and listen to him anything which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded anything which is mubah in the religion he has to be obeyed so here ta'amara here means if he overcomes or becomes a leader by force and even doing so here the Prophet Sallam is telling us about the fitna and about the disarray in the future. The, the ulama have said that Islamic leadership actually occurs in two ways. The one, the appropriate way, the afdal way, the peaceful and the best way, there's no doubt, by the choice of the people of knowledge and position. Okay? Like for example, during the time of the Khulafa Rashidin, there was a shura, the best of the sahaba joined and they gave mashwara and this is who they recommended to be the leader. And these were the best of the best. So there was a sure, there was mutual recommendations here. It was enforced on the people. And that's why, for example, when Abu Bakr and An became the Khalifa, it was understood. It was understood that who was the best after the Prophet ﷺ. When the Muhajirun and the Ansar agreed that the leader had to be from the Quraysh, based on the Rivayah of the Prophet ﷺ. And again, look at the obedience of the Ansar to obediently follow the Muhajirun the people who had migrated from Makkah and accept them as their leader, again, denotes the sincerity of the Ansar even when the Prophet passed away. But anyway, it was understood, the people understood that Abu Bakr was the best of the best and he was the leader and it was unanimous. There was no struggle or commotion or anything like that. It was understood that Abu Bakr Adan was the Khalifa of the Muslimun. So this is the Abdul way, you know, when the people of knowledge and position, they choose the leader, and this is the, the way it should be. However, in Islamic history, we found that after the four Khulafa, and after the passing of Mu'awiyah Radan, that most of the leaders of the Ummah actually gained that leadership through force or overcoming the previous leader in some way or the other. Okay. Well, this is the unfortunate second possibility, and this is why this hadith is very relevant from before and also now in our times as well. Okay. And there's hikmah in that as well. Again, it's hard to swallow, but because this world is not perfect. Okay. And the Prophet also alluded to that. You know, he said, you will see great division. 
much division, much differences. And this is telling the Sahaba, shaking them, that you have to obey the leader even if it's an abd. And indeed, if you look at, for example, the life of the Sahaba, Radhan, when they were to reach you know, those who were like very old, like Anas bin Malik or Abdullah bin Omar, when they were under the ruthless dictator like Hajjaj bin Yusuf, they did not rebel. They could have, but they did not rebel because they understood the greater implications of what that would have. Okay. So the huge benefit which comes in terms of obedience to even the leaders who took take the position in a wrong way is that it's to prevent bloodshed, it's to prevent civil war. And indeed, Islamic history was at its best. We were at our best in terms of a nation as an ummah when there was tranquility, when there was peace. When there was bloodshed, it was a dip basically, a big dip. And we, you know, we gained that when there was security, when there was peace in the various lands, in, the, in our history. So that's very important in terms of unity, in terms of ittihad, in terms of peace and salam. Going forward, then the Prophet says, فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا okay. Then the one who lives from among you, the one who yani, lives past me, he will surely see, he will see great differences, okay. great disunity. And so here the Prophet prophesizes that there is going to be disunity in the Ummah. Okay. فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي okay. Then upon you is my Sunnah. وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِئِينَ Then a binding upon you is my Sunnah and the Sunnah of the rightly guided successors. Okay. So this is the key guiding principle. Don't just merely follow what the people say or do, but follow the sunnah. Alaykum bi sunnati. And this is what the Prophet is telling the Sahaba. Stick to my sunnah and also the rightly guided successor. So those who are rightly guided, the ones who have uh, been passed the torch, and they are the rightly guided leaders, follow their example as well, in addition to my example. And in the ayah we recited, right? فَرُدُّهُ إِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ then return the matter, if there's any differences, return the matter to Allah and His Messenger. And here the Prophet is also adding, and also you can go to the rightly guy successor. Ya'ni Abu Bakr, Ya'ni Umar bin Khattab, Uthman bin Affan, Ali radi an. These were the four rightly guided Khalifa or Khulafa, and you can also add Umar bin Abdul Aziz as well by ijma of many scholars. And they were called the rightly guided Khulafa because they were upon the truth and they acted upon it as well. Okay. And this is why Omar bin Abdul Aziz is included because when he took over, even though he was only alive for a brief period, there was such great peace in the Muslim lands. The whole Ummah felt the security. That it felt because now a rightly guided leader assumed the Khilafah. Okay. Someone who is truthful, righteous, and even because of that, people say that he, he was unfortunately poisoned or martyred and radu anhuma. All of them. You know, may Allah bestow his pleasure upon their life as well. So the last point of this hadith okay, is adherence to the sunnah and also avoidance of bid'ah. Because the Prophet says, Wa iyakum wa muhtatati al umur. This term iyakum, iyakum wa, this is basically to be warned of, okay, be aware of. Like for example, the Prophet says, iyakum wa dhan, fa inna dhanna akdabul hadith. Be aware of suspicion, for suspicion indeed is the most lying of speech. So here the Prophet says, wa iyakum wa muhtatati al umur, and be aware of newly invented matters. فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِعَطِمْ ضَلَالَ And every bid'ah, every newly invented matter is a misguidance. And this is the final wording of the Prophet So he is making us aware of any type of innovation in the religion which has been completed by Allah and His Messenger. وَيَاكُمْ وَمُحْتَتَاتِ الْأُمُورِ And be aware of the newly invented matters because every newly invented matter is a misguidance. 
Okay. From this, let us go back into looking at ibadah. Okay. Because it's very important for us to be even before we go into the sunnah and bid'ah, let's look at the definitions and revisit the definitions of ibadah, which at this point we should really be firm on. Okay. But nonetheless, it's good to sort of put everything into perspective. So any act is an ibadah, if there's an authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which supports the action as an ibadah. Okay. It's also from the Qur'an as well, but specifically the sunnah delineates that because the sunnah is more specific than the Qur'an. Sunnah is in line with the Qur'an, the Qur'an is more general, the sunnah is more specific in terms of the actions of the Prophet ﷺ in various scenarios. Okay. And in ibadah, happens as a result of one of three things. Number one, the action or the act results in a reward in ajr. Okay, number two, there is praise for the one who does the action. So Allah and or His Messenger are praising the action. And number three, the one who avoids the specific action will get blame, curse or punishment. So that's an ibadah. Okay, where some action like salah, like fasting in Ramadan, like the zakah, if you don't do it, then there is something that you're going to get blame, punishment, or even a la'an, a curse, ma'adullah, regarding uh, not doing the specific action which is incumbent on you. So this is ibadah. And what about the sunnah? Okay. What is the sunnah? And we have to, again, know that the terminology sunnah is the general sunnah. This We're not talking about the sunnah prayer after the farud, like after the farud lohar, do the sunnah prayer, right? You, you're told by your parents and you tell your children. But this is actually the general sunnah, like Quran and sunnah, follow the Quran and sunnah. What is that? Well, the legal definition of the sunnah is defined as the practices, the utterances, the actions, and also the tacit approvals of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the sunnah. And for an action to be regarded also as the sunnah, there has to be also additionally two conditions that have to be met. Number one, the outward action of the Prophet ﷺ is imitated. And number two, the intention of the Prophet ﷺ when doing that action was also in ibadah or was for ibadah. So the Prophet ﷺ, you know, was a human being. He had needs. And if there was something he did out of, out of context or not for ibadah, then that actually is not following the sunnah, that is something which he did as a human being or as, a, for example, an Arab wearing his turban, etc. So we have to know that this is what the ulama, like for example, Imam al-Shatabi in his great work, al atisab defines and exemplifies for us in terms of exactly what is a sunnah, what is a bid'ah. Okay. And we briefly discussed that as well. So when we talk about bid'ah, it's really the best definition is violation of ibadah. And unfortunately, there's often a taboo with bid'ah. I mean, often when someone's talking about bid'ah, get the label, oh, this guy's a Wahhabi. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, the great work, the decorated work that he wrote, which is Kitab al-Tawheed, almost 95% of that is purely Qur'an and Hadith. So those who criticize his work are criticizing Ma'adullah, the Qur'an and the Hadith, the authentic Hadith of Rasul Salaam. And this was the point of this great scholar. Putting all together what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger have dictated regarding various actions which constitute what is ibadah, what is outside the scope of ibadah, what is shirk. This is what this scar put and these are basically the words of the Prophet Sallam, Allah and His Messenger. So whoever wants to criticize the work is really criticizing Allah and the Messenger because of ignorance. And so we have to take the best from the ulama and Humble ourselves from the knowledge which they give us, insha'Allah. And not be influenced by false labels as well. Um, and of course, those people who are extreme in terms of certain things, we have to also take the middle road, insha'Allah. Put this hadith alongside with hadith number 5. It just gives a full perspective where the Prophet says in the hadith, Man ahdata fi amrina hada ma laysa min fahorad. Whoever invents something other than what we have brought, in this matter of ours, whoever fahwara, then is to be rejected. So going forward, so there's two types of bid'ah or violations of ibadah. One is clear, irrefutable, and there's one which is relative. 
And Imam Shatabi, this is what he, he mentions this also in his book, Ihtisam. A clear violation occurs when there is no evidence to support a specific action from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Okay, and we talked about, like for example, the rolling dervishes, inventing some new way to sort of gain barak or gain hasanat, which aren't even there. Now, the relative violation occurs when there is a legitimate action of ibadah from the Qur'an and Sunnah, which is then, in, and there's an improper link to that action or thing. Okay, for example, let's look at the issue of performing congregation of dua after the salah. There's much evidence for making dua. Of course, there's no doubt. Like, for example, the Prophet ﷺ says, dua huwa ibadah, this is authentic. And there are times when the Prophet ﷺ made congregation of dua as well. However, despite this, there's no evidence that the Prophet ﷺ did congregation du'a after the salah, like congregation of du'a. Okay. Thus to insist on doing this, like du'a after salah, congregational, is a relative violation of ibadah and, and also should be avoided because you're making a link after a certain action and people may even think that this is the, the way of the Prophet ﷺ. This will stray the community in that respect. And often what happens is when you invent a new matter or you bring in a new perspective, this then the people lose sight of the actual authentic sunnah, which is the dhikr after the salah. To do it here and there, you know, inshallah, no problem, but if you're in a congregation where this is happening, then you break away from it just to prevent that relative violation of ibadah. Sometimes it's okay, of course, to join in terms of congregation dua, no problem, but to make it consistent as if it is some sunnah, that is, of course, something which should not be done. Okay, so this is a, a makruh bid'ah or undesirable bid'ah. Similarly, you can make the case of like reciting Surah Yasin every time when someone dies. This is something really which there is no authentic hadith on, but to read the Quran is of course something which is praiseworthy, particularly to remember death, to remember those moments, to remember Allah Subhanahu wa Taala during this trying circumstance. So instead of doing Surah Yasin, maybe you could mix it up with other surahs for the community to prevent again this relative with our relative violation of ibadah. Okay, so to make an improper association with the sunnah to something else. That's something we have to also steer away from because the Prophet dictated what we have to do in every specific circumstance in our life. SubhanAllah. This is the beautiful essence of knowing and familiarizing ourselves with what the Prophet actually did. Because if we don't, then this is what happens. We have these false associations of certain actions and we think that this is something which the Prophet actually did which he didn't do. Going forward, okay, manners in which ibadah can be turned into bidah. The salaf, including the likes of Imam Malik rahimahullah, and others were very scrupulous in the matters of bidah or violations of ibadah. Okay, one story is illustrated which Imam Shatabi narrates in his book al Tisam. Okay. And here he states the Mu'addin at the time of Malik was making a sign with his garment then Malik sent for him and said to him, what is this that you are doing? He said, I intended to let the people know about the sunrise so they can be mindful. Then Malik said to him, do not do that. For you are inventing something in our city that has not been done. Indeed, the Messenger of Allah Sallam, was within the city for 10 years in Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Badanhum. They had not done so. Then do not invent what was not done. Then the Muaddin refrained from this. Then there was a period Then he, the Muaddin, began clearing his throat in the minaret during the time of sunrise. Then Imam Malik sent for him and said to him, what is that that you did? He said, I intended to let the people know about the sunrise. He then said, was it not for you to invent with us that which was never done? Then he said, I only stopped from Tathneet, making a sign of my garment. He said to him, do not do that. Then he refrained for a time. Then he began striking the door of the minaret. And then Malik sent for him again and said to him, what is that you are doing? He said, I intended to let the people know about the sunrise. He then said to him, was it not for you to invent in our sea that which was never done in it? So this is a beautiful story. Just looking at the scrupulousness of the Salaf, like Imam Malik and many others in terms of the bid'ah or anything which was similar to going in that direction, even to the point of clearing the throat during the Adhan. And another example, this is narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, okay, this is an example of turning ibadah into a bid'ah, is in the action of 
Abdul Malik bin Marwan, the fifth Umayyad Khalifa, and he was remembered for appointing the ruler Hajjaj bin Yusuf to maintain the tight control of the Umayyad rule during that time. He gave the Eid Khutbah before the prayer, and Abu Sa'id al Khudri narrates himself. He says the Prophet used to proceed to the Musalla on the days of Eid al Fitr and Eid al Adha, and the first thing first thing to begin was with the prayer and after that he would stand for the people and the people would keep sitting in their rows then he would preach to them advise them and give them orders yani the khutbah the people followed this tradition till i went out with marwan the governor of medina for the eid al fitr prayer or eid al adha prayer in this narration and when we reached the musalla marwan wanted to get up on the pulpit before the prayer i got hold of his clothes but he pulled them and ascended the pulpit and delivered the khutbah before the prayer. I said to him, غَيَّرْتُمْ وَاللَّهِ فَقَالْ أَبَا سَعِيدْ قَدْ دَحَبَ مَا تَعْلَمْ فَقُلْتُ مَا أَعْلَمُ وَاللَّهِ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا لَا أَعْلَمُ لَا أَعْلَمْ فَقَالْ إِنَّ النَّاسَ لَمْ يَكُونُوا يَجْلِسُونَ لَنَا بَعْدَ الصَّلَاةِ فَجَعَلْتُهَا قَبْلَ الصَّلَاةِ So Abu Sa'id said, you have changed. By Allah, you have changed it. Okay, yani, you've changed the Prophet's tradition. He replied, O Sa'id, God is that which you know. I said, By Allah, what I know is better than what I do not know. And Al Marwan said, People do not sit to listen in our khutbah after the prayer, so I delivered the khutbah before the prayer. And this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. Kitabul Aidain. Okay. So here, even though Malik al Marwan's intention was good or seemingly good in that he wanted to make sure the people listened to the khutbah before they left, but it went directly against the sunnah of the Prophet. And this is why Abu Sa'id al Khudri narrates this narration. Going forward, violations for ibadah continued. Well, violations are different in terms of degree and they are not all equivalent. Okay, a violation of ibadah that is kufr or leading to kufr is much more evil, no doubt, than the violation which is not. However, a violation of ibadah which is not related to kufr is certainly much worse than a ma'asiyah, a sin. In spite of this, with regards to hereafter, the bidah which falls under the same category of ma'asiyah in that the doer, the doer can still be forgiven or punished. The worst crime, of course, against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is number one shirk. And those things which are shirki, after that, it basically becomes those bid'ah which are close to shirk. So bid'ah has a higher level of evil than even great sins. It's a major sin. We have to be familiar with the sunnah and avoid the bid'ah. Not every person who commits kufr is a kafir. I mean, there's people who may perform things or engage in activities which are shirki. Here in the States we have... Halloween, we have Valentine's Day, these are based on pagan rituals, pagan festivals, and many people who are engaging in them are not aware of that. Or if they are, they don't think it's, it's, it's direct negation to Islam. You know, it's a more like a fun thing to do. But you have to be very careful in terms of the labeling. And I mean, anything which is shirky, you should definitely avoid, no doubt, because it can negate all the actions which you're doing. You know, anything which falls into kufr is just something which is a area, you do not want to just abolish all the good things you need to do because it's action which is perhaps can be defined or considered sure, that's why we have to avoid those things which are, have anything to do with paganism or those type of festivals it's completely against our deen, for example, to wear a cross because this is something which obviously is a violation of the principle of Tawheed so that's obviously act of kufr because it's understood that you are accepting the trinity guard protect you and yourselves from the fire and there's so many pitfalls around us which can easily you find the right direction you go the wrong place can easily be a fire for us okay. so going forward the person who commits abida or even perhaps an act of kufr can be excused in the following situations. Number one, there are misconceptions or improper understanding related to the respective action. So a lack of knowledge may be an excuse. Or number two, if one lives in a place where there is no scholar available who can establish the hujjah, the evidence, or remove the misconceptions, or offer true guidance. Okay. 
Number three, someone who's a new Muslim, who's unaware of these issues involved. So basically there's some negligence, or there's some ignorance, which is accounted for because of lack of knowledge, you know, not intentionally. And number four, the action attributed as a bid'ah is not agreed upon by the scholar. So if there's some ikhtilaf, then that's also obviously a wild reason. Who is the innovator? Who is the mubtadi? Okay. So the one who intentionally ascribes an act that has no affirmation of the Qur'an, the sunnah, is a mubtadi. And this can include also an incorrect or improper belief in Islamic aqidah. So some of these sects, often they have a very variant or just a outrageous, incorrect belief. You know, for example, you have those who believe in the 12 Imams and their infallibility goes against the, the tenets of aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and against Tawheed as well. Okay? Well, those type of beliefs have nothing to do with Islam or will go against Islam, these fall in that category or even worse. And there's two opinions concerning the Muqtadi, the ones who commits a bid'ah. The first opinion is that only the actions committed in tandem with the bid'ah will not be accepted. Specifically, since it may be likely that this person may be following the sunnah in a general sense. Okay, so this is important why we should stick to the authentic knowledge of the Prophet and be wary of false practices and the ahadith which are fabricated as well. Okay. The second opinion is actually more harsh and is an opinion which many scholars actually hold and is that none of the deeds of the one who is committing the bid'ah action will be accepted from the person, unless he repents. Okay. And in clarifying the second more strict opinion, Imam al-Shatabi argues that you will not find someone committing a violation of ibadah in just a single action. For example, if one commits a violation in the salah, it's likely that he is also committing a violation in another ibadah. This opinion can also be looked at from another way as well, in that number one, a statement you know, at face value that none of his or her deeds, whether of fard or sunnah, may be accepted. Number two, the violation of the ibadah is actually an aqidah, which may negate all of the person's actions. So if, for example, someone's competing against the Prophet for a way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this obviously is a direct insult to Allah and His Messenger. But for example, in those who curse Aisha and some of the sahaba of the Prophet rejecting them, okay, whose honor is protected in the Qur'an, who are they going against? Who are they going against? Isn't the statement of the Quran enough? How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us so many ayahs to protect her rank and her chastity. Or about Abu Bakr Adan. Clear, who was the second person with the Prophet in the cave? And number three from the second opinion is that the violation in ibadah is a sign of a person's lack of knowledge of the sunnah, disrespect of the sunnah and of placing his intellectual reasoning ahead of the sunnah. Okay. And we discussed this, if you recall, in hadith number 5 in detail. Okay. So putting this beautiful hadith into perspective, okay, in conclusion, the first advice that the Prophet gives is a central advice to every Muslim, which is to have taqwa. Okay. Following this, the Prophet stresses the importance of obedience to the chosen leaders. There are many reasons for this, and many times we may not understand the complexity of that reason, because they are the leader in a higher level. Intellectually, they've been placed into a position where none of the people have been put into. The responsibility is great. So, and most important part of this reasoning is to promote the peace and unity of the Muslim Ummah. And the third part is hadith, anticipates a future event which is the disunity of the Muslims into groups and sects due to deviation. And in facing a situation, we are lastly advised to hold on to the sunnah. As in many ahadith, the main point of this hadith is the last piece of advice. Okay? And we saw what happened with the khawarij. Right? Those who were, went against the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and they broke off and they were a great source of fitna to the Muslim Ummah. These advices are just as relevant to us during our time as they were back then when the Prophet was delivering it to the Sahaba. Okay. And these advices are also very important for us in the future as well. And furthermore, much of the discussion of this hadith focuses on the finer Sharia points regarding the Sunnah and the Bid'ah. 
a good understanding of this topic is essential for each and every Muslim. We have to exercise care in our practice of worship, and we have to do the best to emulate the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. And doing so will prevent violations in ibadah, and also prevent our ibadah from being wasted, and from us being misguided. And in order to adhere to the Sunnah and refrain from the violations of ibadah, a Muslim needs to fully understand and apply these principles pointed out by our great ulama. And by doing so, disputes and quarrels among the Muslim community and members over seemingly many controversial issues can be clarified and resolved. So Jazakallah khair for your attention. And may Allah give us tawfiq in applying these beautiful advices of the Prophet in our lives and also spreading the khair. Subhanaka Allahumma wa hamdik wa nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa sakfakatubu wa ilayka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.